Hey everyone, Chris here. Thanks for checking out the podcast. If you're enjoying it and learning something along with us, please consider becoming a supporting patron at patreon.com slash a teacher of history. Or you could leave a rating and review on iTunes. It would be a huge help. If you'd like to raise your hand and participate along with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, at a teacher fifth, or shoot me an email, chris at a teacher history.com. All right, let's get on to the next episode. Hello, and welcome in to A Teacher of History of the United States. Thanks so much for joining me again today. Did you know that early in the outbreak of rebellion, the Texian forces found themselves stacking up victory after victory, and that Santa Anna set aside his presidential duties so he could personally lead an army into the field to crush the rebellion? And that politically and militaristically, at least in the time leading up to their conflicts with Santa Anna's army, things were sort of a disaster for the Texians. Did you know all of this? Maybe. Maybe not. Get your notebooks out because today we will cover that and more in episode 132. The Revolution Begins. All right, everyone. Welcome into episode 132. We are going to dive into the Texas Revolution today. And uh, no book recommendation with no real update for you, so let's just get right into it. Last episode, we began our examination of the Texas Revolution. We spent some time talking about the independence movement in Mexico and connected why the instability in Mexico created the situation that ended up welcoming in Americans to Texas. I've already heard from a couple of people that mentioned they didn't totally understand where I was going with it, early on in the episode, but by the time we were all finished up, they were glad they had a broader context for the origins of the Texas Revolution, which is great, as that was exactly what I was hoping and wishing for. If you thought it was a little too much Mexican history on a United States podcast, well, don't worry. We're ready to dive into the revolution, and for the most part, it will be all U.S. history from here on out. So, last week we set the stage, yeah? Mexico gained its independence from the Spanish Empire in 1821 and immediately began to struggle in forming their own government. With the caste system so distinctly dividing its population, it had trouble coming up with a governing system that could meet the needs of all its people. On top of that, Mexico's sheer size was overwhelming to some, with the northern parts of the country unprotected and vulnerable to Native American attacks. With this in mind, the Mexican government decided to open up immigration into Coahuila y Tejas, hoping that the presence of the Texians would create a buffer between the Native Americans to the north and the rest of Mexico. In addition to that, if the American immigrants could create a profitable society in the northern regions of Mexico, it was a win-win. For many Americans who were looking for opportunity in the West following the Panic of 1819, it made a lot of sense and seemed like a great option. As you know, though, there was a catch. They had to convert to Catholicism, give up their slaves, speak Spanish, and report their immigration status to the Mexican government. With these requirements causing significant frustration for many of the Texian immigrants, Santa Ana's coup of the Mexican government and his subsequent consolidation of power added fuel to the Texian fire. After a handful of failed attempts at independence, it looked like in fall of 1835 something was going to have to give. While the Mexican government had placated the Texians in a few different ways, they were still frustrated and genuinely believed they would be better off as an independent republic as opposed to being part of Mexico. All that was needed was a spark to light the fuse. And that, and more, is what we're getting into in today's episode. So, how did all of this start in the first place? Well, as tensions were high, it seemed as though many Texians were just looking for a reason to start a fight. And on September 10, 1835, well, they got that reason. In the small town of Gonzales, 
a Mexican soldier got into an altercation with a resident of Gonzales. The argument turned into a fight that saw the Mexican soldier literally bludgeon the man to death. And this naturally enraged many citizens of Gonzales and gave them another reason to believe that the Mexican government they were forced to live under was suppressing their freedoms that they rightfully deserved. With these rising tensions being pretty undeniable at this point, the Mexican government thought it would make sense to confiscate the cannon that was in Gonzales. See, the Mexican army had lent this cannon to the Gonzales resident in the early 1830s, so like a few years back, in order to help them protect their lands against Indian raids. Well, as you can imagine, when the Mexican army said that, you know, almost five years later they wanted the cannon back, well... The Texians were not totally interested in obliging. In fact, they did the opposite. They dug their heels in. When a small detachment of troops was sent to retrieve the cannon, they were unsuccessful. Being very careful not to cause any violence, they left peacefully without it. But the Mexican colonel at the time was having none of it. He then decided to send 100 dragoons, which is basically a cavalryman, to demand the settlers hand over the cannon. Keep in mind, this is a single cannon. Now, to be fair to the Mexican authorities, they were under strict orders not to cause violence or instigate, but that didn't mean that the settlers couldn't convince themselves that they were there for exactly that reason. With the Mexican army sending in what seemed to be a ridiculous amount of soldiers just to secure a single cannon, the settlers in Gonzales were convinced that the Mexican army was in fact there to instigate some type of conflict, somehow figure out a way to attack the town and get rid of its militia. After stalling for a couple days to wait for reinforcements, a group of about 140 Texian militiamen attacked the Mexican forces on October 2, 1835, seeing two Mexican soldiers killed and one Texian killed from falling off his horse. Lieutenant Francisco Castaneda requested a meeting with the Texian leader, John Henry Moore, to work out a resolution, a peaceful one if possible. After Moore and Castaneda could not come to a resolution, Moore returned, and he and his men flew a flag above the cannon that said, quote, Come and take it. Castaneda knowing that he was outnumbered and was in less than ideal circumstances, decided to drop the rope in this tug of war and retreat it. The Texians declared victory over Mexico, which was a bit of a stretch, but true or not, men did fight and men did die, and technically the Mexican army was the one that retreated, so sure, victory over Mexico. But either way, in the minds of many, the Texas Revolution was officially on. News of the skirmish spread throughout Texas, and men began to flood into Gonzales and prepare for the revolution that so many of them had been clamoring for for years. As more volunteers flooded into Gonzales, pumped to get this revolution started, the men unanimously elected Stephen F. Austin to be their leader, which was a curious choice if for no other reason that he had literally zero military experience. Doesn't happen very often. This, quote, army of the people which was the name Austin had given them, had little discipline and varying degrees of experience and perspective, which makes sense considering they elected a guy who had no military experience to lead them. What they did know, though, was that Castaneda had retreated with his men to Behar, which, by the way, is spelled B-E-X-A-R, which for a totally, like, illiterate person like me of any language outside of English— very confusing. And down in Texas, they apparently pronounce it bear. So if I say Behar or bear, um, and you wanted to look it up, it's B-E-X-A-R. Anyway, rant over. So that is where the, the, <laughs> the Texians, knowing that Castaneda had retreated back to Behar, um, that's where they were planning on heading next. With Castaneda retreating back to Behar, General Martin Perfecto de Cos who was the brother-in-law of General Santa Anna, because nepotism is always a good idea in warfare, decided to head to Behar too, to meet up with him and combine forces. Not knowing that Kos had traveled to Behar, on October 10th, 125 volunteers, a group made up of Texians and Tejanos, Tejanos were the Spanish descendants living in Texas fighting for the revolution, stormed the Mexican garrison in Goliath, hoping to kidnap Kos and the cash he was rumored to carry with him. 
but of course, Kof wasn't there. So the garrison was taken with little effort, seeing three Mexican soldiers killed in the process. Captain Philip Dimmitt took command of these combined Texian and Tejano forces. He sent some to join Austin in his preparation for his march to Bejar, while sending others to take another Mexican fort near San Patricio, which they were able to do with little issue. The good thing about taking these garrisons, although on paper it didn't really seem to do much, is that it allowed the Texans to control the Gulf Coast, which then forced the Mexicans to send all of their communications through the interior over land, which took a lot longer and led to some critical communication delays. But let's turn our attention back to Austin and his men. They'd begun their march toward Bejar to take out General Kof and his Mexican troops, and they were feeling pretty, pretty good about themselves. Prior to reaching the town, they actually sent a message to Kof asking him to surrender, or else put Texas through a civil war, which really, no one wanted. But Kof, unsurprisingly, did not give in to the demands of the Texians and refused to yield. In late October, about 650 Mexican troops began to barricade the town, preparing for a Texian offensive. On October 27th, Jim Bowie and James Fannin led an advance party looking for a campsite for the Texian army closer to the town of Bayar. They chose Mission Concepcion, which was a church that had been established by the Franciscan friars. The Mexican forces had gotten word that the Texian forces were divided, and doing what any smart military commander would do with that information, they decided to attack Bowie, Fannin, and the rest of their advance party. But what the Mexican forces weren't totally prepared for was the terrain they were going to be fighting in. In the Battle of Concepcion, what many historians believe to be the first real conflict of the Texas Revolution, whatever that means, the Mexican forces were drawn into battle in a wooded and river-bottom terrain, which shouldn't be surprising since they were fighting against Jim frickin' Bowie. Difficult terrain aside, though, the Mexican forces made three advances against Bowie, Fannin, and the rest of the Texians. With the Texians' rifles having much longer range than the Mexican muskets, they were able to hold off all three advances. Only one Texian soldier died in the Battle of Concepcion, with dozens of Mexican soldiers perishing. The exact numbers are still, to this day, unknown, and the range is pretty big. But what was definitely an overwhelming Texian victory just continued to inflate the men with confidence and convince them that this revolution was going to be theirs to lose which may not have been the best perspective. But I think many would agree that it's better to have men who are overconfident in battle than men who are convinced of their own doom, I guess. While Bowie and Fannin were out there making mincemeat of the Mexican forces at Concepcion, Austin and his men were beginning to lay siege to Bejar in late October. The siege dragged on for a bit, and during this time, a few notable things happened. First off, the Texian army got their first group of American volunteers from New Orleans, which was pretty cool. These volunteers, known as the New Orleans Graves, actually had uniforms, ammunition, and a semblance of discipline. If nothing else, they seemed to know what the hell they were doing, which was a welcome sight for many of the Texians. Secondly, Austin resigned his command as he became the commissioner to the United States, and Edward Burleson took over. As the month of December loomed, both the Texian and Mexican forces were struggling with low morale. Things were so bad with the Texian forces that Burleson considered just packing up and heading to the Goliad until the spring to wait for warmer weather. Afraid that this retreat was going to be the next move for the Texians, two Texian men personally recruited other soldiers to attack Behar with them in a last-ditch effort to take the city. Colonel Ben Millam and Colonel Frank Johnson led several hundred men door-to-door throughout Bayar, and it worked. On December 10th, dealing with his own case of extremely low morale and ignorant and experienced troops, General Kof surrendered Bayar. Kof said that he and his men would leave and never fight against the Texian insurgents anymore. This meant that there was literally no Mexican army in the province of Texas. No Mexican troops there. They were all retreating. What began with a mission to Gonzalez to take a cannon ended with the Texian troops winning battles at Concepcion and Bayar, and to many, winning the Texas Revolution. In fact, some were so certain that this puppy was all wrapped up, Burleson resigned his leadership of the army and headed home, as did others. <laughs> 
up to this point in the revolution, which, by the way, uh, spoiler alert, isn't over yet, um, men like the New Orleans Grave had given many of the Mexican soldiers the impression that the Texian forces were made up of outside volunteers. But as of December 1835, when Bayar was surrendered to the Texians, that really wasn't the case. The overwhelming majority of the forces were from Texas, or at least had been living there for years. Now, following the victory of Bayar and the subsequent regrouping of the Texas army and the time lean up to the Battle of the Alamo, the composition of the Texas forces changed dramatically, with the percentages totally flipping, seeing a large majority of the Texas soldiers being made up of recent immigrants from the United States, making the Texas forces basically an American militia operating in the Mexican province of Texas. That same fall of 1835, back in San Felipe, the Texas Consultation, which was a group of representatives in Texas, formally created a provisional government. While they didn't declare independence, they also refused to rejoin Mexico until some type of federalist system was reestablished and Santa Ana decentralized his power. Good luck with that. On November 13th, this provisional government created an army and named Sam Houston as its commander-in-chief. And remember just a moment ago when I mentioned that the makeup of the Texas forces changed dramatically around this time to being largely composed of volunteers from the U.S.? Well, that's because this provisional government gave Sam Houston the ability to offer land bounties in exchange for men who would volunteer to fight. Bribes have a historical tendency of being pretty effective. And this bribe was no different. But that didn't mean everything was peachy in Texas. There were a lot of problems. For one, there really wasn't enough food or supplies for all the troops, so they ended up just taking them from locals, which is something that never seems to go over well. The delegates, also, of the consultation elected Henry Smith as governor, only to impeach him less than two months later. They didn't know if they were fighting for independence or they were actively looking to return to a Federalist Mexico, which seemed to be a pretty important decision to come to. They wanted to hold a vote on what their official platform should be, but they couldn't agree on who should be allowed to vote. Frank Johnson, who had assumed control of the army after Austin's resignation, wanted to lead an expedition to Matamoros, an expedition that Houston talked pretty much everyone out of participating in. To further define the division within the Texas Army, Houston then decided he was going to leave the army behind and journey east to try to negotiate some terms with the Native Americans in the region. The leftover men who didn't go to Matamoros were led by Fannin, the colonel who fought with Jim Bowie at the Battle of Concepcion, back to Goliad. On top of all of this chaos in the army, the vote on Texas's political and military platform that was supposed to take place in February, well, wasn't super organized or effective. Shocker. Wow. So, let's just sort of revisit here what just happened over the past three months of Texas history. The Texian army had won the Battle of Concepcion, uh, what many historians believe to be the first battle of the revolution, and taken the city of Bayar. With the Mexican army retreating and some thinking the revolution was already over, considering the fact that Colf surrendered and said he would never fight against them again, Burleson resigned his position, putting Frank Johnson in charge of the army. Then the provisional government was created, put Sam Houston in charge as commander-in-chief of the new Texas Army, and recruited a whole bunch of Americans with promises of land grants to fight in their revolution, only to realize that they hadn't actually decided if it was going to be a revolution or not. When Governor Henry Smith was impeached, Sam Houston wasn't totally sure he was the credible leader of the Texas Army anymore, considering Henry Smith was one that appointed him in the first place, so he abandoned the army to head east to negotiate with natives. Meanwhile, Frank Johnson took 70 men to Matamoros on an expedition, while James Fannin took the rest to Goliad. Then they tried to hold a vote for convention delegates in February that ended up being a mess, only to hear that Santa Ana was preparing a large army to march north to crush their little rebellion that seemed to be falling apart pretty well on its own. Thank you very much. Oh, and did I mention that about 100 Texian soldiers were still in Bejar following the siege, holed up in an old Spanish mission called the Alamo? Well, more on that next episode. But before we wrap up with our lead-up to the Alamo, I think it's worth taking a look at how Santa Ana feels about all this revolting that's going on in Texas. 
Well, in late October, Santa Anna received word of the skirmish in Gonzales, and he was none too pleased about it. Remember, Santa Anna was fully aware of how difficult this Texas lamb would be to control, and he knew that the biggest threat to his power was likely going to be a significant uprising in the region that could potentially spread to the neighboring provinces. So when he heard of the Texians in Gonzales not just being obstinate but violent, he was sure he was going to personally see to it that their little flame of rebellion was put out immediately. There was no way that Santa Ana was going to allow these Anglo immigrants to refuse to conform to the laws and culture of their new country, began rebellion, and live to see the end of it. Not on his watch. Santa Ana turned his presidential duties over to Miguel Berrigan, dusted off his old military uniform, and saddled up. And let's be clear here, Santa Ana expected victory. Period. I mean, heck, the Mexican Secretary of War, Jose Maria Tornel, wrote that, quote, the superiority of the Mexican soldier over the mountaineers of Kentucky and the hunters of Missouri is well known. Veterans seasoned by 20 years of wars can't be intimidated by the presence of an army ignorant of the art of war, incapable of discipline, and renowned for insubordination. But that being said, Santa Anna and Tornell probably deep down knew it wouldn't be easy. Santa Anna worked tirelessly to build an army, taking out loans that he personally promised to pay back if necessary. He created the Army of Operations in Texas. Most of the troops were either forced into service or were convicts who chose military service over jail time, so not exactly the ideal makeup of forces. Oh, and did I mention that there was corruption at every turn, and they had little supplies and rations and no medical doctors? How about coats and blankets for the winter? Nope. Didn't have any of them either. On top of this, while the Battle of Concepcion had proved that the Mexican muskets were no match for the Texian rifles, uh, Santa Ana was convinced that with his superior numbers, which he did have, and superior planning, which, mm, not really, he wouldn't have much trouble dispatching the Texian forces. In what ended up being a really important piece of legislation that flew way too far under the radar, Santa Ana, in his final preparations for his march, got the Mexican Congress to pass the Tornell Decree, which stated that any foreigners fighting against Mexican troops would be, quote, deemed pirates and dealt with as such. This is really important. At this time, captured pirates were executed immediately. Therefore, this decree meant that all captured Texian or Tejano soldiers would be dealt with the same way. There would be no prisoners of war in this conflict. As you could probably imagine, most volunteers for the Texas Army were unaware of such draconian measures, and it may have impacted their decision if they knew of this decree. So in December of 1835, Santa Anna began his march of 6,000 convicts and forced soldiers with little food, rations, clothing, medical supplies north toward the Texas Army. Very slowly. And with supplies and rations low and men deserting for obvious reasons, Santa Anna was excited to be joined by General Kulf and his men, who had surrendered at Behar. And even though they promised not to fight anymore, Santa Anna ignored all that and chalked it up to a silly misunderstanding. In the end, you just made a promise to rebels. You don't have to keep promises to rebels. Santa Anna decided to send 550 of his troops toward Goliad and lead the rest of his army toward Behar, the site of his brother-in-law's surrender and his family's embarrassment. This, of course, is the location of the Alamo. Supported by his Tejano spies, Santa Anna knew he would have the upper hand in Bayar by a lot, but that didn't mean it would be easy. With the February temperatures dropping into the teens, his men were totally out of their element and lacked supplies to stay warm and healthy. And while some were dying of dysentery and hypothermia, with others being picked off by Comanche raiding, he continued north, determined to revenge Colsa's surrender. And that is where we will leave off today in episode 132, with Santa Anna's army split off to attack Goliad and Bayar with overwhelming numbers. The Texian army was, meanwhile, in disarray, with the Texian government disorganized and divided. And the subsequent battles at Bayar, or the Alamo, and Goliad are not going to go well for the Texian forces, which we'll talk about in much more detail in next episode. Thanks for listening, and hopefully now you can take pride in knowing just a little bit more about the history of the United States. Class dismissed.
A Teacher of History of the United States podcast is supported by its fans at patreon.com slash a teacher of history. Those of you who are able to contribute, I can't thank you enough as it keeps this podcast going and allows me to continue to make time to provide you with the most in-depth and comprehensive history of our nation that I possibly can. A sincere thank you to all of our patrons, especially those at the Teacher's Pet and History Nerd level who help to sponsor the show. Their names can be found on our website at aTeacher'sHistory.com. And a super special thanks to our History Nerd patrons, Krista Sandstadt, Rita Huckle, Tammy Smith, and Pamela Caldwell. And my new best friend, Norm McLaughlin. We couldn't do the show without you. <laughs>